Hi everyone, welcome to this video discussing ecological analysis as part of our larger study of critical media studies. I'm really excited about this one. I love ecological analysis. That's one of my favorite uh, theories in the whole realm of communication studies. So I'm really excited to talk about this. Now, ecological analysis may bring to mind thoughts of, you know, the environment. Are we going to be looking at things from environmental impact? And not exactly. That's not really what we're talking about, not global warming and that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, but we are going to be talking about an ecology in an interesting way. So uh, let's jump in here and see what we find out. First of all, ecological analysis examines the role of media ecology in the uh, perception, understanding, feeling, and value of an artifact. So the key there is really media ecology. And what do we mean by media ecology? Well, we're going to get into that, but really we're talking about the entire environment surrounding um, the, the channel and the, the technologies in, uh, around uh, through which that communication takes place. And how does that impact uh, us as individuals and us as a society, our interaction with one another? How does that impact our, as it says, our perception, our understanding, our feeling and our value, the value that we have of um, an artifact? So um, all the things surrounding that, but really coming back down to um, one thing. And the, really, so the major premises here um, that we're, that we're going to be focusing on in media ecology is what's called medium theory. It's grounded in what's called medium theory. Now, as you may recall, medium is really just another word for channel. So the channel is um, how that's being communicated. So medium theory has to do with the technology, how the technology or the or the individual medium of communication and, and that is uh, that. Uh, indicates that the, that the technology or the individual medium of communication is equally important to or even more important than the content of the media to understanding our social environment. So the impact that the, again, that these, that the choice of channel and that the method of, of delivery of this media has in, and how that can be just as important, if not more important than, um, than, um, than the content of that media in the way that it uh, that it, it uh, affects our our social environment and our, our our interpersonal communication the way that we relate to one another and the way that we communicate with one another so anyway that's really what medium theory is getting at is that it surrounds the technology and the individual medium of that communication so there are a couple different um, avenues we're going to explore here starting with there are a couple different kind of phases of medium theory we're going to start by talking about what's called technological determinism and then we will get into the more recent um, um, kind of definition of that area, which is media ecology. Okay. Um, so before we do that, though, let's just break down medium theory real quick again, uh, just in a little more uh, direct way. First of all, um, when we think about medium theory, there are really three principles involved here. Um, the first is that each medium, medium theory says that each medium has a relatively unique and fixed set of characteristics. So there are particular things that are true about a medium. So if we're using the medium of, you know, just say social media in general, that's different than the medium of a post-it note, which is different than the medium of a phone call, which is different than the medium of smoke signals, right? Each of these has some unique characteristics and some fixed characteristics that are there about them. Some things that are true about them, some things that relate to them that are different from other forms. And you can even, you know, if you want to get even more specific and dive into this, they're different, for example, there are different uh, characteristics and and uh, uh, for the different types of social media. If we got into the social media, there's you know we there's things that are different about Facebook than about Instagram, than about Twitter, than about um, you know TikTok and so forth. Right? All of these have different characteristics uh, that are that are unique about them and that are also fixed about them. So every medium has a relatively unique and fixed set of characteristics. That's the first point of medium theory. The second is that those characteristics then produce a particular communication environment. So the way that we communicate using those things is affected and is, is determined really by those characteristics. Okay, so the, those characteristics produce that particular communication environment. They're influenced that, by that and those characteristics then create a, a really unique and specific environment. And then finally, the communication environment that is created then has consequences for human consciousness and social organization. So it's kind of a, a flow here, a process, and then all of that comes back to effect as we're going to see it's, it's almost turns into a circular thing here. But so each medium is unique. 
and has different characteristics. Those characteristics then create a specific communication environment. And that environment then impacts how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to one another, uh, and creates that communication environment through which we communicate with one another. Okay, so that's the, the, the three principles, the three points of medium theory in general. So let's take a look then at the at one specific uh, kind of uh, foundational area of medium theory. And that's the work of a gentleman named Marshall McLuhan, who worked in what's called technological determinism, what he called technological determinism. Uh, McLuhan was a, a psychologist, really, but, but focused on communication theory and, and, and the interaction and the way that technology impacted that. He said that uh, his, his belief was that a, a, a society's technology determines its cultural values, its social structures, and eventually in, in overall its history. Right, that the technology that's used during that time that, that dominates that time has such a, a tremendous impact on those areas that it really ends up affecting every aspect of, of human interaction and of human development. And so he said that, that, that the society's dominant technology really determines all of those things, hence the technological determinism that I'm in the, in the theory there. Uh, he also stipulated that, uh, or, or, or postulated that social progress is driven by technological innovation that our society and our society's progress is really uh, tied to or specifically connected to technological innovation. And that's really not difficult to see in our modern times, is it? Uh, with the, um, with the um, uh, rapid progression of technology and the way that that has impacted uh, the way that we interact with one another and our society in general. You think about, uh, um, for, I mean, just our own personal use of social media and things like that, and how different it is from even just 20 years ago and, and how that's impacted our society. Um, uh, but then you, oh, if you want to put it in a more specific context, um, recently we've seen the impact that those types of technologies are having on things like um, white supremacist groups. They are much more able to organize and to um, to, to coordinate um, from a distance, even without really having to, to gather until they want to. So, I mean, there's all kinds of advantages that that uh, that social media and the Internet in general have offered to groups like that. So uh, it really impacted social progress in, in a variety of different ways, some good, some bad. But um, uh, so social progress is driven then by that technological innovation. And then finally, the, the technological determinism this examines the effect of technology on the nature of human relationships. Okay. So, uh, so, so McLuhan said that, that, that uh, humankind has gone through these different um, phases of media history and the dominant technology of that time has really impacted the nature of human relationships. So for example, if we just look at these individually, these different aspects of media, the periods of eras of media history, uh, first you have what, what McLuhan called the tribal age, um, back before really predating even um, uh, the written word where, where uh, history and everything was connected to, um, to the orality of communication. Everything was, was uh, through spoken word. So you really had this not only um, to, sh you had not, not only share a language, but you had to, to be in a ge geographic area that allowed you to, uh, to hear that language and to communicate that language. So everything was really tied together. Um, in a sense, not only did they live close together, you could go 10 miles and they'd speak a different language and you might not have any idea what somebody was saying. So that would be very different. Um, there's also the sense of connection in terms of um, collectivism, you know, people were living in close quarters and you really depended on that group for survival. So really going out on your own was not an option as much. So, um, so you really were, were really connected not only within this tribal group as a whole, but then within the different groups within that tribal group. So really had this, these strong connections and, and were very much, um, dependent and codependent on one another in the tribal age. Then you have the literacy age where some people could start to read. Now we have the written word. That would be the first innovation, technological innovation that McLuhan cites is the, the development of the written word. And uh, so that then some people became literate and that allowed them to kind of move away from the group a little bit could, because you could still be a part of that group. You could still communicate. You could still gather the history and things and not have to be right in the same village necessarily. It also allowed people to, to communicate over greater, um, uh, expanses of geography, right? You didn't have to be in the same area. You could write things down and send it and have an accurate uh, communication and have, you know, ways to communicate with people outside of just the spoken word.
So you have the literacy age, and people you see that people start spreading out a little bit there. And they're still a little, largely a part of the tribe, but uh, but some spreading out there. Then you have the print age with the, that, that was uh, ushered in by, again, technology, ushering in a, chain, a massive change in society, that technology then being the printing press. Um, so then not only do you have some people who are literate, but more and more people are becoming literate and can move away from the tribe, right? And don't have to be centrally located necessarily. They can move away a little bit and, uh, and still have that information, still have that connection, um, still be able to communicate across large um, uh, stretches of geography. Um, you start to see this in, in, for example, in the in Western, in our Western, what we call Western civilization here in the United States, uh, the westward expansion, you could be out on the, the, the frontier, but still uh, have books, still be connected, still get newspapers and magazines and, and still keep up on what was happening in the outside world without having to be right in the center of town. And so, uh, so you know, just even thinking about the print age in that sense, then you have more people who are literate and, uh, and literacy continues to grow and grow and grow. More people had access to those materials and were able to kind of decentralize again, move away from the tribe a little bit. Next, you have the electronic age, which, uh, you know, rep Kind of may have started with the telegram, but really radio, television, those types of things. Um, you have the electronic age, and, and then you see people that are connected, but now the communication really is spread out. We're able to, to really isolate. We don't have to be around the other people to be connected to them, right, in a sense. We can still get the news. We can still get the same entertainment and not ever really have to be around people. We, we, you start to see this uh, kind of isolation. Um, obviously, it has an impact on the way that humans interact, and and that's really what McLuhan's getting at. These these uh, the technology determines kind of how we're engaging with one another, how we're interacting with one another. That's really was his major point in all of this, and the different types of media um, they, they cause us to think differently, cause our processes of uh, of thought to change, and, uh, and the way that we process information and gather information, all of this changes. So. Uh, the electronic age, you have, you know, the, the tribe is shrinking and uh, the necessity for the, the, you know, the dependency on that tribe is shrinking a little bit. We have that kind of outward communication going, but, uh, but we can see we're, we're much more isolated. We're much more independent. Then we have what's been tentatively, there's a lot of names for this, this last one here. There's the third age. There's, there's all kinds of stuff, but uh, we're just going to call it the new media age. Of things like the internet, basically with the advent of the internet, is what we're talking about, and really ushered in a different style of communication. Again, when we think about you know the fact that we can bounce all over here, you, you know, no longer is it just coming from this one central location. Now we are creators. Now we are communicating with one another directly. Now, we're, and it's created what's called this, uh, what some people are calling the global village, right? Of you know this connection with people all around the world. The world is shrinking in that regard. Now that does not mean we know people better or that we're communicating any better. It just means that we are able to connect a little more to people outside of uh, you know th that isolation. A little bit so, um, not everybody's communicating with everybody, obviously, but uh, but we have different path pathways of communication that are happening in the new media age. And we'll talk more about that here in a few minutes, but, um, one other just quick item from, from McLuhan. One of the famous things he said is the medium is the message. And it's part of this quote, the medium is the message. This is a passage from one of his books. The medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is of any extension of ourselves, which in his mind, the medium media are extensions really of ourselves as humans result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by extension by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology but what he's saying here is the medium is the message that the you know the, the, the way we choose to communicate that message says a lot about what we feel about that message says sometimes more than the content of that message itself uh, when you choose to break up with somebody, you're in a relationship, you choose to break up with them face to face. That's very different, sends a different message than breaking up with them via text or via a post-it note or whatever, right? So um, th there's the mediums there communicate very different um, messages about how you feel about that person, how you feel about that relationship, how you feel about the content um, that you're communicating. So uh, in, that's where McLuhan is coming in, saying the medium is the message. In many ways, the medium uh, communicates something more than the content of that message. Anyway. So that's technological determinism. Then we, then we you know, continue to evolve, continue to expand on this. You have a, a gentleman named Neil Postman. Uh, 
right? Neil Postman comes up with this idea. He expands upon uh, McLuhan's theory and says, okay, beyond technological determinism, we have what we call media ecology. Okay, so now we're starting to get into the more uh, contemporary sense here, media ecology. And what, uh, what Postman said about this is that media ecology really describes a holistic systems based e examination of the symbiotic relationship between humans, technology, and the environment. Okay. The environment here being the context is what he's really getting at, the context, the environment, the situation in which that communication takes place. So it's what he called a symbiotic relationship. It's not a um, one that one exclusively drives the other, but it's one that, 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 where these three things work in conjunction in their evolution. Right. So um, he also said then that the aim of media ecology is to increase awareness of the mutual effects. That was his purpose in, in defining mutual media ecology was to increase the awareness that people have of these mutual effects and that the, the impact that they each have on each other. And finally, he talked about how this is a dynamic process rather than just technology as a singular driving force. So McLuhan's technological technological determinism said that technology drives this and society then follows and that's it right it's the technology that drives this but uh, postman says no it's the it's really a, a symbiotic relationship but so it's dynamic it's constantly changing it's not just a singular driving force there's multiple causality going in here we can we kind of compare this in the, and you know the, the reason the word ecology comes into this is because we're thinking about the same type of ecological system that you see for example in the sahara you have different animals that are all doing their thing and, and not necessarily working together, but each of them impacts uh, this environment, right? When you lose a, a, a piece of that uh, ecology, whether that's, uh, you know, an animal goes uh, into extinction or, or becomes rare, or, you know, one of the resources, um, you know, water becomes very rare and you change the ecology of that situation, it changes that entire system, right? Everything is impacted and everything is connected. Everything is symbiotic. Um, so uh, Postman was saying that's exactly what's happening with um, media ecology, with our relationship with this technology and the media as well. Um, so uh, to where, again, McLuhan in technological determinism said that technology evolves and then humans adapt and then technology evolves again and then humans adapt. But it's really technology driving that whole process. Uh, Postman said that the media ecology cycle is a little different. He said, first of all, we have this mediated communication. So mediated communication just being any communication that uses technology, right? So we have this mediated communication, whatever it is, whatever is presently in use as that mediated communication, the dominant mediated communication is what there is. Then you see though that new tools are developed. Okay. So we have what's existing in that mediated communication, but then new tools are developed. And then you have maybe the adoption of this new technology, right? And not all of it's adopted, but, um, but um, much of the time it is, you know, so you see these uh, tools that are, that are adopted. Um, so who knew that uh, Facebook was going to be become what it is, right? Who knew that TikTok would ever be popular? So we have the, you know, the adoption, and then we have other you know types of social media and different types of technologies that are not adopted. Right? Or that, that are adopted and then go away. You know, MySpace is an example, if you can recall MySpace, right? So some of us remember MySpace, kind of a precursor to Facebook. It was very popular for a short time, and then it went away. It was supplanted by Facebook. It's nowhere to be seen now, right? So you see maybe the adoption of this new technology. And when it is adopted, though, then it becomes kind of normalization. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Facebook was new you know, relatively new. I'm, I'm able to remember when you had to have a college email account or a .edu email account in order to sign up for Facebook. It was exclusively for college students. Then it became something more than that. And, and then it became the normalization. I can also recall when my mother joined Facebook, right? And that's the time I was in her seventies, right? And then I thought, okay, well, this is obviously becoming a normalized technology. It's not something that's unique anymore for, for young people. When you got all people of all ages doing it, it's become the norm now. And it's become kind of the standard, you know, it's no longer that cutting edge, um, technology that's that's sort of new right it's no longer in erotic analysis what we would call transgressive it is now um, just the, the the norm it's become the norm and then that becomes then the mediated communication that becomes the new norm right that becomes our mediated communication well eventually new tools are developed 
Facebook was there and then Twitter came and then Instagram came and then TikTok came. And so these things continue to develop these, you know, and it continues this cycle, but there's a symbiotic relationship. People have a place in that cycle. Uh, whether or not we adopt it, whether or not we normalize it, you know, whether or not we use it. And somebody's got to develop these tools, right? Technology just doesn't develop itself. So somebody's got to develop these tools. Um, so we have this symbiotic relationship, this, you know, kind of companionship relationship um, with these things. So in, in creating these, so uh, this is what we mean by media ecology, then the symbiotic relationship between these different technologies and humans and our environment in which we, we, we communicate the situation, the context in which we communicate. So presently, as I mentioned before, we are in what's called the new media era and there are different names for it, but that's, that's a very common one. It's the new media era. So I want to take just a second and talk about what we mean by that. So to define new media, we just need to understand that new media means any media that uses computing technology to create, store and distribute data. So really anything with a microprocessor would be considered new media. Now that really kind of confuses and, and can get you know muddy because, you know, we talk about television as part of the electronic area, right? Well, but a lot of television is now run through microprocessors, right? The television itself, as well as the streaming services that you might use to watch this. So is it electronic age or is it new media age? You know, it's really just kind of an evolving thing, but generally speaking, if it's, if it uses a microprocessor, we're going to call it new media. If it uses computing technology to distribute and create and store that, that data, then we're going to call it new media. And that's what we mean by new media. Now there are a few characteristics of new media that we need to be familiar with. The first is that it's digital. We just talked about it, it uses computer uh, technology, computing technology to, to do all those things. So it is digital. It's, 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 uh, it's shared and it's, it's created and it's stored in bits and bytes and, and, uh, it is it, digital new media is digital and, and takes advantage of those digital technologies. Then it's also variable. It's variable, both in the sense that, um, of, of how we can create these things and the, the function of those things and the way we use this technology and the way we use the information we get from this technology, but also in the way that we can access this technology. Lots of times digital new media will have multiple entry points. For example, you don't always have to check Facebook from your phone. You can check it from your computer. You can check it from a lot of these different things. You can check it from your watch. Maybe now you can do, you know, all these different things. So, um, it's variable both in the way that we use and, and, uh, function with that information and also how we then access it and things like that along those lines. It's also interactive. Um, new media is interactive, meaning it's, it's not just one way. Right. Radio and television, those are things that uh, in, the, in that time you didn't really see a lot of independent, you know, creation of radio and, and television programs and things like that. It, it was all run through the system, basically. You, you were running through that, that media industry, the, the traditional media industry. But gosh, how many of you are YouTubers now? Right. Whether you, I mean, how many of you have created anything and put it on YouTube or, or filmed anything and put it on YouTube or written a blog or, or contributed in some way or interacted, have you responded or commented to one of your favorite stories or to a community or message board or, or things like that. New media is interactive. It is a two way street. It allows us to be both uh, consumers of the media, but also producers and creators of media and engage in that aspect of it. Uh, it is connective. Uh, it, uh, it does connect us. Now, again, that does not mean that we are, uh, that we, we have, uh, you know, enhanced our relationships necessarily, but it does mean we are more connected. Uh, how many, uh, I always joked, I'm, uh, full disclosure, I'm not on Facebook anymore, really. So I, I don't really do a lot of social media. So, um, but when I was, I used to, I used to look at my Facebook page sometimes and think, I, I, how many friends do I have? How do I have this many friends on Facebook? I don't have this many friends. I don't, you know, the people that I would call friends. I know a lot of people and that that's really what this is that I, these are people I know, but they're not my friends necessarily, but I'm connected to these people. So I'm finding out what they're having for dinner, what their kids were on the first day of school and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and it was, it was fine. It was nice, but um, doesn't help me necessarily know them any better or really, you know, establish a connection, but it is connective. It does connect us to people all over the world, um, people that we know, people that we don't know, um, and it does help us be more connected. Now, again, whether or not that's a good thing or not may depend on the day, but we are more connected for sure. 
It's also virtual. Even when you're talking to somebody, you know, on the phone, live, face, I mean, person to person, in, in real time, in real life, you're talking to somebody on the phone, even if you're FaceTiming them, it's still on the other end of some technology. They're being, you know, their information, their image is being sent through the ether, right? Through these bits and bytes that we talked about, because it's all digital, which makes everything virtual, uh, has advantages and disadvantages to that. So, uh, but we need to understand that, that new media is virtual. All, every aspect of it really is virtual. There are also a couple of key impacts of new media that we need to consider. Some things that um, that we need to uh, bear in mind. Ways that is, this has changed the way that we, again, as McClellan said, the way that we interact, the way that we engage, the way that we think. Uh, it has impacted all these things. Even if it's if it's not just the technology developing, as he would have indicated, but more like Postman said, it's a symbiotic relationship. But that doesn't change the fact that it has an impact on the way that we communicate and the way that we interact, the way that we relate to one another and the way that our society functions really. So um, first of all, the, um, new media is what we call associational. It's associational. We think back in time, you know, when I, when I was growing up, you, when you read books, you, you listen to cassettes, you do whatever, it's very linear. Everything is very linear, right? You, you move from A to B to C, you read a book from A, you know, from page one to page two to page three, all the way through. Right now, when I was a kid, I loved choose your own adventure books, but have you hop around a little bit. But for the most part, our learning was linear. We listened to, to albums and cassette tapes in a linear way because that's what we had available. We listened that you start at the beginning, you go through to the end. Everything was very linear, and that's how our mind worked then, right? Uh, it was in a very linear fashion. Okay, what what do I need to get from A to B to C and so forth? But uh, with the development, uh, one of the impacts of new media is that it's very associational, which really implies that we're very nonlinear, right? As you can see here, it's no longer A to B to C. Now it's A to wherever you want to go. Think about the difference between reading a book and, and, uh, and getting on the web, right? Like I said, it, when I read a book, when I was, when I was, you know, growing up, or even today, when you read a book, you start at page one, you go through all those different pages, right? You, start, you move through those pages, it's a very linear process. And so our, our mind works that way. Our mind is, is, is fashioned in that linear way. And I mentioned when I was growing up and I listened to cassette tapes, I wore out my copy of Metallica's Injustice for All and, and all their other stuff, but I loved Injustice for All. I listened to it all the time, but I listened to it from start to finish you didn't jump around first of all because it was a pain to, to do so on a cassette you would have had to fast forward and you could never really exactly get to the right spots you always fast forward and then rewind and get to the, the beginning of a song or whatever but um so you just listen from beginning to end and bands knew that a lot of times they made an album with that in mind right that you were going to listen to it from beginning to end so there had to be a flow sometimes there was a story to it um but I listened to that album from beginning to end. I didn't jump around uh, or anything like that. And now even I have a CD. I have the CD that I listen to quite a bit still when I'm working or doing whatever. I still listen to it from beginning to end because my mind is very linear in nature because that's what I grew up with, that A to B to C. But compare that linear nature with surfing the web. You know, how many times have you gotten down the rabbit trail, right? Or, or, or gotten pulled down, you know, like like Alice in Wonderland, right? Get pulled down that hole of, you, you get on to do one thing on the internet and all of a sudden you're clicking and you read a paragraph or something and then you find another like, oh, let me click on this and I'll go over here and I'll go over there. It's not linear. You don't start on page one of the internet and go through to the end, right? You, you start where you're starting and then maybe you get to the end of that and go to something else, but maybe you just skip around. You know, I, you know, I have this issue in YouTube all the time when I'm going there for something specific. I'll go there looking for some information on something or a how to video on how to do something. And then all of a sudden I'm watching videos of soldiers coming home from, you know, and surprising their family or I'm watching, you know, cute pet tricks or I'm doing, you know, things like that. I just get pulled in all these different directions. It's, it's associational. We have the same thing when I, again, when I was growing up, when we watched TV, you waited until the next program came on. Right. You didn't have the opportunity to jump around. Now we can watch what we want when we want. And in fact, we get pretty frustrated. I know I do, even though I didn't grow up with this, I get pretty frustrated when I have to wait. What do you mean? There's only one episode out a week. What is wrong with you people? Just put them all out at once and let me watch them when I want and how I want and so forth. Right. If I want to watch it on my TV or on my phone, or if I want to switch halfway through and I'm, you know, I'm tired of watching it on my phone. So I'm going to go watch it. I want to be able to do what I want. That's what we mean by jumping around here. Like there's no linear process anymore to all this stuff. With new media, we can jump 
we can go wherever we want and, and you may get from a all the way to to g without ever going through b and c you may not have any connection to b and c at that point you may not have to so uh, there's all kinds of things that, that we do differently and our mind works differently now in that regard our mind works differently uh, and and uh, people who've grown up with this have grown up with this associational um, kind of impact and so uh, we need to keep that in mind that th that's one way that new media has impacted us is that it's very associational it's it's much less linear than the traditional medias it's also contingent right everything is contingent now again when 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 i was growing up I, you basically had books and and magazines and things but if it was printed in a book it was it was pretty solid i mean that was pretty much it that was considered sort of the gospel right it's considered sort of the end all be all right but now anybody can print anything right not just in book form but on the internet and you can find information now like you couldn't before uh, i can't imagine how we ever um, got along without being able to just pull something up on google immediately and have an answer to something my friends used to, and i used to argue about stuff constantly who was the lead singer of this band or whatever and we we just have to wait till somebody got the cassette tape and we can look in the liner notes right um, we didn't have the instant impact but so now everything is contingent right everything is is you know it's, it's maybe maybe true maybe not true um, it may be true for now maybe true for you uh, but then i'll go out and find this other information right or at the very least i'll go out and hit hit refresh and have some new information to share with you based on what i found on the internet so everything is contingent now they're very it's very hard to find an absolute truth in, a, in essence, right? It's very hard to find an absolute truth in the age of new media because somebody will just come and, and um, make a statement about something different or put something else out. So it's very different to find uh, an absolute truth in the age of new media. New media is also what we call prosumptive. Prosumptive, right? Which is a combination uh, of two different ideas, right? The idea that, that, uh, that, that media is consumptive we consume media we are consumers of media but we are also as we mentioned we are also producers and creators of this media so producers and consumption consumptive prosumptive new media is prosumptive it is both uh, something that we consume and that we produce um, we are very much producers of new media um, just this video for example is a production of new media that i never would have imagined uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, really wouldn't have imagined that I would be doing something like this, that people might view it uh, at some point, um, that, uh, that never would have uh, occurred to me. That's not something that I would have been able to do. Um, I didn't have the facilities to do that. I could, there's no way I could just do it sitting in my home right here. I have all the technology that I need <clears throat> to be a creator now. Um, but, and, and everybody does really at this point, right? If you've got a smartphone, which is pretty much everybody, right? You can be a creator. You can be a producer of new media. Everybody virtually has that opportunity in, 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 in the society in which we live here in the United States. Virtually everyone has the opportunity to be both a producer and a consumer. So new media is then prosumptive. And finally, it's affective. Affective, not effective, but affect affective meaning that it has an impact on a, a really on our, on our body on our physiologically it impacts us in a way right um it's much more intimate new media is much more intimate and personal than old media would have been so um when i was in college for example if i wanted to listen to music and i had roommates all through college but i had to consider those roommates right i had to consider that you know Really, I mean, I had headphones that I could use and things, you know, big over the ear type things, but who does that? And I was limited in range and things. So you never do that. So instead you just pick music that, you know, your roommates are going to like. Fortunately, I like a wide variety of, of music. So that wasn't as much of an issue for me, but uh, I always had to be mindful of, you know, well, I can't really listen to, to my you know, hardcore metal if my roommates here and doesn't like that kind of music. Um, so it's, it's less personal in some ways. It's less, uh, intimate because it's more of a shared experience and more of a generic experience in that regard. But new media is very intimate, very personal. We put in our headphones, we put in our, our, uh, our, our, our earbuds and we, and we have our phones out and we're, we're consumed by this, right? But it becomes much more personal. It becomes much more intimate in that regard. We can be in our own little world and, and it does affect us physically, not only in terms of what we're hearing and what we're listening to and, and what we're, what, what we're seeing, but the fact that it does kind of 
close us off? How many times have you run into something or tripped over something because you've been uh, on your on your phone or, or listening to something and not paying full attention to what you're doing? It, it is affective. It affects us in a, in a very physical, uh, very real way then. Right. New media does much more so. And, and it's really become more about um, not just what we think, but what we feel about something, how we feel about something has become much more important um, than, than what, what we might think about it. We, we go with our gut a lot more on these types of things. So really just thinking again about the ecology, the environment that this new media has created and, and continues to create the different medias that we have and how this changes the way that we connect with one another, the way that we relate to one another, the way that we communicate to one another, the way that we see ourselves and communicate with ourselves, all of these things, the way that this impacts our society and in, in big ways and in small ways, uh, media ecology is everywhere. And so it's something that we need to, to keep in mind and consider as we, as we really focus on uh, that critical aspect of, of media studies. I hope this has been interesting to you. I hope you've uh, understood now ecological analysis a little bit better, that it's not really just about the environment, at least not, you know, again, in a sense of global warming and recycling and things, but, but more about the environment in which we live and the environment uh, that's created by the media. And, and, and then establishes our society and really influences our uh, society and has an impact in that regard. If you have questions about this or about ecological analysis or about any other aspect of critical media studies, uh, please feel free to email me. I'd love to chat with you about this via email and, and answer any questions that you might have. In the meantime, I hope you'll get out there and really have a renewed understanding of the impact that the different medias have in the way that we can communicate with one another, relate to one another, engage with one another, and, uh, and, and again, positive and uh, potentially negative ways uh, all the way around. And, and just the impact that that media has on us uh, as in, in ecological, in an ecological sense.